Unafraid to diversify and experiment, Nintendo has worn many hats over its long history in the video game business, but something that has remained consistent throughout it is their very evident affinity for peripherals. Whether it's the infamous Rob the Robot, some DK bongos, or a headset made from cardboard, fans have come to expect the unexpected from their accessories. As unconventional as some of them may be, there have been many others that didn't make it to market, and in this video, I'll be delving into a handful of them, from proposals Nintendo shot down to fully greenlit projects that were later cancelled. We begin with the oldest case study on our list, which takes us all the way back to the third generation of home consoles. The NES sported its share of unusual accessories, like the pressure sensitive power pad or the notorious power glove. A similar such curiosity almost joined their ranks at the start of the system's lifespan, as revealed years later by ex Nintendo game master Howard Phillips. The company had been extensively mulling over the concept of an officially licensed Nintendo knitting machine. The device would have connected to the NES to knit sweaters, and users would have been able to choose from a multitude of different patterns. According to Phillips, it was Nintendo of America's president, Minoru Arakawa, who instructed him to pitch the product to Toys R Us founder and chairman, Charles Lazarus. He was apparently given very little notice, about 30 minutes in fact, to prepare for the meeting. His presentation included a live demonstration of the product prototype knitting machine in action, which Phillips described in a Facebook post as likely one of his least genuinely enthusiastic demos. Toys R Us and other retailers weren't interested, nor were attendees of 1987's Winter Consumer Electronics Show, who had a chance to view the machine in its one and only public appearance. After flying under the radar, the Nintendo knitting machine faded into obscurity and was never put into full production. The GameCube went through various iterations over the course of its conceptualization. Nintendo, in their perpetual search for new innovations, trialed a number of emerging technologies during its creation. This led to multiple unrealized peripherals that were considered and prototyped extensively. The first was a GameCube controller which included motion sensors. Nintendo's history with such technology is well documented. The company quietly experimented with it for years before building it into hardware like the Wii. Few people outside of Nintendo were privy to their motion sensing GameCube controllers, but the developers at Factor 5 Inc. were among them. According to a developer who worked on GameCube launch title Star Wars Rogue Squadron 2, they had even flirted with the idea of using the motion controls in that game after Nintendo granted them access to the early prototype controllers. This wasn't to be, however, as the technology was vetoed by Nintendo shortly thereafter to focus on making a more traditional console and decrease production costs. Another long-term obsession of Nintendo's is 3D, a fascination which eventually culminated in the Nintendo 3DS. This technology was also tested on the GameCube years earlier, although these attempts got much further than their aforementioned accelerometers. Nintendo was once planning to release a small LCD screen which could be attached to the GameCube, alleviating the need for a television and enabling a greater level of portability. This add-on made only one public appearance at E3 2002. It could be seen behind glass, displaying demos for games like Fantasy Star Online and Metroid Prime. Unbeknownst to attendees, the prototype unit had a hidden feature, which remained a company secret until former Nintendo president Satoru Iwata revealed all years later. It was fully capable of displaying glassless 3D, via the same method of auto stereoscopy used by the 3DS. In 2001, producer Hideki Kono had been involved in creating a 3D version of Luigi's Mansion that would use this device. It had depth, so it really pulled you into the world of the game. I thought it was great, Kono said. Despite this positive internal reception, it was held back from release by production costs. Liquid Crystal was still expensive back then, and no matter how new an experience we could provide through the games, there would have been a need for players to buy the LCD as an accessory. There was even talk that it could turn out to be more expensive than the console itself. While Nintendo's version never came to market, third-party manufacturers stepped up to the plate with their own LCD screens, minus 3D, and battery packs, allowing the GameCube to be fully portable. 
In 2007, Factor 5 Inc. proposed to Nintendo rebooting some of their long dormant franchises like Kid Icarus and Pilot Wings. For the latter, the studio envisioned an original peripheral to be released alongside it. This was a pair of glasses with two infrared lights mounted on them, a gadget inspired by a 2007 viral video from computer scientist Johnny Lee. In the video, Lee demonstrated a setup using a Wii remote and infrared glasses that could produce a 3 3D effect, as well as tracking the user's head movements. The user would position a Wii Remote facing away from their screen towards them. The Wii Remote's IR camera would then detect the infrared lights in the glasses, transmitting this information to a computer program. The end result was the user's ability to adjust their view of the camera in the program by moving around the room and tilting their head. Factor 5 wanted to adopt Lee's concept and use the peripheral in their Wii games. Players would have been able to seamlessly adjust the in-game camera via head tracking, presenting a possible solution to the Wii Remote's and Nunchuck's lack of a second analog stick. According to the studio's president Julian Egbrecht, they were talking with Nintendo in 2008 to potentially produce the device, although they weren't interested in making either of their proposed reboots. The heads of Factor 5 persisted nevertheless and decided to develop their Pilot Wings game as an original IP called Wii Fly. Another publisher named Zoo Games picked the game up and with it their Wii Glasses peripheral. According to Zoo Games co-founder Lee Cummings, they had planned to produce the glasses in-house and were holding discussions with potential manufacturers in order to do so. In the meantime, the team was creating prototypes using parts from disassembled Wii sensor bars. However, However, the rocky economic climate of late 2008 forced Zoo Games to go out of business, leaving their Factor 5 projects without funding. A previously interested Nintendo declined to intervene, and Factor 5 Inc., unable to pay its workers, closed in December 2008. The Wii's head tracking glasses would never see the light of day as a result. The two games that did support it, Wii Fly and Star Wars Rogue Leader's Rogue Squadron Wii, never saw release either. One Nintendo accessory that did eventually launch was the Wii Zapper. This plastic mould could house the Wii Remote and Dunchuck to mimic the feel of an arcade light gun. Debuting alongside Zelda's spin-off Link's Crossbow Training, it would go on to be supported by only a handful of games throughout the generation. The original vision for this peripheral was quite different from the final product, however. Initial designs imagined a device with slightly higher production quality that would have effectively served as an add-on for the Wii Remote, more akin to the Nunchuck. A prototype model for this iteration of the Zapper was shown off at E3 2006. Unlike the finished design, it more closely resembled a shotgun as opposed to a submachine gun. The device would connect to the Wii Remote's connection ports and had its own control stick built in. It also had a trigger hole with one large button instead of the Nunchuck's two shoulder buttons called Z and C respectively. As development went on, this prototype zapper was given its own independent rumble feature. Players could insert one additional AA battery into the device, which would provide rumble feedback to the whole zapper when players successfully hit a target in their demo. Nintendo's sources explained that concerns about pricing were to blame for this version of the zapper being next. A comment from Nintendo designer Shigeru Miyamoto in an Iwata Asks interview seems to support this suggestion. We decided against it because we really didn't want customers to have to buy the extra batteries. That's one of the reasons developing this product took so long. Its rumble functionality and control stick stripped out, the Wii Zapper was essentially reduced to a plastic shell. It was finally released in late 2007. In January 2008, Israeli tech firm 3DV Systems announced a new webcam called the ZCam. This was billed as a desktop camera with an infrared sensor for tracking the movements of its users. It was capable of sensing depth, allowing it to detect how close users were to it, as well as their exact gestures with low levels of latency. The device made a few appearances at trade shows throughout 2008, including the Consumer Electronics Show. Its primary application was for video games and 3DV demonstrated this with a boxing game prototype. 
Responses among attendees were said to have been positive. Sites like IGN expressed their admiration for the accuracy of its controls. What wasn't known at the time was that prior to these public showings, the Z-Cam was originally proposed to Nintendo as a potential peripheral for the Wii. 3DV presented their ideas to the higher-ups of Nintendo in late 2007, according to CVG. Their presentation is said to have left an impression on the company's management, including Satoru Iwata. They apparently showed off their aforementioned boxing demo and a prototype of the Z-Cam with voice recognition functionality. They presented it as a new twist on the motion controls that Nintendo had pioneered, reasoning that it would be a natural fit for the platform's audience. Although their presentation is said to have impressed them, Nintendo ultimately did not agree. According to a source from their Kyoto HQ, Iwata himself raised concerns about input lag and that it would be too costly to sell as an additional accessory. For context, the Z-Cam was later set to be sold as a standalone product for PCs at an estimated price of $100. The two parties consequently went their separate ways, and the Z-Cam would never officially be released. Microsoft bought 3DV out in March 2009, and three months later, they revealed Project Natal, an Xbox 360 peripheral using essentially the same technology. After some cost-cutting measures which downgraded the hardware, it was released as Kinect in late 2010. One of Nintendo's more infamous unreleased peripherals is the well-publicized Wii Vitality Sensor. This gadget was unveiled by Satoru Iwata at E3 2009, where he briefly discussed its potential applications. The Vitality Sensor was a small device which could read the user's pulse from their index finger. It would connect to the Wii remotes and send this information to the Wii console, allowing games to monitor their pulse during gameplay. If Iwata's comments are any indication, Nintendo saw the accessory primarily being used as an aid to lower the player's heart rate and help them relax. He also discussed it being used to extrapolate other information from inside the body, such as mood and anxiety. The company even foresaw the potential for software using it that would help people fall asleep easier. At its reveal, no release information for the Wii Vitality Sensor was provided, but internal estimates expected it to arrive in late 2010. Following E3 2009, no further details were provided for some time to come. The lack of news was acknowledged by former Nintendo of America president Reggie fils in a March 2010 interview with Kotaku. The first thing we need to do is show our vision for how the Vitality Sensor can be used for a new and unique experience, and we recognise we haven't done that yet, he said. Our focus is to bring to life how you could utilise the Vitality Sensor, and our goal is to do that sometime around E3. That goal would go unrealised. The Vitality Sensor did not appear at E3 2010. Then EVP of Sales and Marketing, Kami Dunaway, provided Game Set Watch with a justification as to why this was. As we thought about what we wanted to bring to E3, we realised we had a really packed agenda. We also thought about the atmosphere at E3, which is noisy and adrenaline filled and loud and stressful, and it just didn't seem like the best environment to introduce a product that's really about relaxing. So we decided we'd think about other venues that would be more appropriate. As time went on, this pledge wasn't followed through on either, and updates from Nintendo on the accessory stopped. Rumours swirled about its cancellation in 2010, but it would be another three years before the company would officially reveal its fate. The project and its related software had been shelved amid concerns about the device's reliability and its viability as a commercial product. In July 2013, Satoru Iwata explained to Nintendo's investors, we could not get it to work as we expected expected, and it was of narrower application than we had originally thought. Nintendo had carried out extensive trials for the accessory throughout the twilight years of the Wii within the company. 100 employees tested the Vitality Sensor, but it was found that it only functioned as intended for 90 of them. The device was supposed to work by observing the waves produced by the pulse and interpreting this information to quantify how tense or relaxed users were. However, the technology was too simplistic to do that accurately for 100% of users. It therefore fell short of a lot of standards, although he expressed the company's desire to one day try again if the technology allowed it. 
We would like to launch it into the market if technology advancements enable 999 of 1000 people to use it without any problems, not only 90 of 100 people. I actually think it must be 1000 of 1000 people, but it is a little bit of a stretch to make it applicable to every single person. For more content like this, please don't forget to subscribe. You can support my research on Patreon like these kind people did. I've been Liam, and I hope you'll join me for another Game History Secrets.